Are y'all all right tonight? Yeah. All right, good deal. I, I want to take you very quickly to the Word of God, and I know you're in the dark out there, so if you've got a Bible on your phone, you can find it fast. If not, I'll just get to it. I, I just want to encourage somebody tonight uh, and pray that God will bless. If you if you uh, know much about me or what I my ministry, my ministry primarily for the last decade or more has been to hurting people, wounded people. And how many of y'all know America's got a lot of hurting people? Amen. And, and, and there's something about bringing God the needs of our lives. Um, I, I love to see God move on people who have wounds. And one thing I love about tonight is I don't even know you. I mean, if you can see what I see, it just looks like, I mean, everybody could be real quiet and get up and leave. And I keep preaching because I can't see but like four of you right now. Uh, but only the people who haven't tanned this summer are the ones I can see right now. But um, I, I, what I love about a room like this is I may not know your name. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know where you're going. But the great thing about a night like tonight is this, is, is that everybody in here has got something behind you that you know now if God hadn't been there. Come on, help me, somebody. If God hadn't been there, you would have never crawled out of that garbage. Anybody, is there any witness in the house tonight that God does come through for you? And so, and so with that in mind tonight, I want to just release you. You ought to be praising God in this place tonight. It don't matter who's sitting beside you or who's applauding or who's not applauding. You know why? Because they weren't there when all hell broke loose for you. And this is a night, if you've walked in this building, the front or the back, and you've got some scars and some wounds, or, or you keep looking backwards, or that enemy keeps reminding you of your yesterday, it's time for a new day. And I believe that night is tonight for you. And I believe that somebody's going to leave here tonight. You're going to sleep better tonight than you've slept in a long time. You say, what does that have to do with revival? If it doesn't start personally, it will never go globally. Come on, talk to me. And His strength will never come to a place that you won't first admit is weak. And so I want tonight to crack past your religiosity, take your church face off, it's Friday night, y'all. Let's have a conversation. All right? I, I want to take you tonight to Hebrews chapter 4. And I, I know my brother was in Hebrews just running rampant last night. Amen? And, but I want to go back to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Just, just a couple of verses here that I pray God will strengthen and use this in your life some way. Hebrews chapter 4. And verse 14, listen to what it says. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Here it comes, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of... What is that last word? Does anybody... Can anybody see it? Need. 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 I'm going to read it one more time. And y'all say the last word with me when I come to it. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. Thank God for that. Grace to help in the time of, say it with me, need. Everybody look this way. For a few minutes tonight, I just want to encourage you. I don't want to hold you too long. In fact, I want to get right to the end of it so we can watch God lamb blast this place. I want to talk tonight for just a few moments from the subject. If I can put a tag on this text. I want to talk to you tonight from the subject, all you need is a need. All you need is a need. You thirsty for God tonight? Amen. You hungry for God tonight? You sick of the dryness of your spiritual desert? You sick of drama on Facebook? Sorry. <laughs> I'm tired of drama chirping, amen, on tweets. Anybody sick of it? Does anybody in here just get sick of it all? You're right for a move of God. Because I'm going to show you for these few minutes that we spend together in the Word. All you need. Not two years of church services. Not 15 years of volunteering. All you need to see the presence of God rock your world, squirrel. 
All you need is a need. Amen? Ooh, that's good preaching right there. Sorry, I'm going to have fun tonight. I feel good. I think my Starbucks is kicking in now. Yeah. There is no place that you can be, no situation, no problem, no circumstance, no matter how bad it may get in your life, that God cannot get to you. Amen, somebody. The, the psalmist said, if I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take flight to the ends and the extremes of the earth, you are there. One time David tried to find God's birthday and he went on a big search and he concluded at the end of his big massive search, I can't figure out how old God is. And he said this phrase, you'll remember. He said, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Colossians says, by Him all things consist. Meaning that if God withdrew Himself from this cosmos, from this earth, from this world, this universe, nothing would hold together. It says in Colossians, by Him, not by Obama, not by Al Gore, not by Hollywood, by Him. Not by Buddha, not by Mohammed, not by Krishna. It says, by Him all things consist. It means if God withdrew His presence tonight, everything would fall apart because all things consist. That means the chair that you're sitting in would fall completely apart if God withdrew His presence. Fabric would, would shred. Molecules would burst atoms. If God withdrew, think about it, if God withdrew His presence, nothing would consider or continue composition because the book says, by Him, all things, all things, all things, everything in your life, everything you dream of, everything you envision, every physical manifestation that you see in this world, every intangible, I, by Him, all things consist. Amen. See, I never have to look for God because the book of Acts says that God is always near. And yet, we have a problem, sports fans. This omnipresent God tells us, seek me while you can find me. God, if you don't know much about God, or maybe you don't go to church much, understand something, or if you go to church all the time, understand something fresh tonight. God loves for you to seek Him. I don't understand that. I don't get it. But He likes... We have a God who loves to play hide and seek, y'all. I don't like it, but I like to be religious and say I found Him when I was a nine-year-old boy and life is good. And yet this God, this lover of my soul, loves for me to chase Him. What girl don't like to be chased by somebody that might love her into their a relationship, a marriage, a life? But God loves to play hide and seek. Because there are moments in life, and I know you've had them, and I, I don't want to be the only honest person here tonight. There are moments when we say, God... Where are you? Anybody? Where are you? It's what God said to Adam. Remember back in the beginning, God said to Adam, He said, where, in King James Version, where, where art thou? It was after the fall, they'd sinned, they'd blown it, they were hiding. And God came walking through the cool of the garden and said, Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? Now understand something. When God asked Adam, Adam, where are you? God was not going around like you, you couldn't find your car keys, you know, going to class. Where is Adam? I lost that little sap sucker. He was over here praising me, and now he's out hiding naked with some woman. I don't know where. Adam, where are you? Understand this. When God asks a question, you don't have something to give back to Him that He didn't know in the first place. So when God said, Adam, where are you? He was not saying, Adam, where are you? He was wanting Adam to admit where Adam is at. And tonight, maybe you're here because God is saying, Debbie, where are you? Ryan, where are you? Brady, where are you? Bobby, where are you? At this stage of your life, where are you? In other words, oh, watch this. Let this hit your soul. Why are you so satisfied, Adam, to live without my presence? Where's your hunger? What happened to you, Brady? J Jacob said one time, God was there. And I didn't know it. God was present. And I didn't know it. It, it would blow your mind tonight. How much His presence is all around us right now. 
Forget for a moment. I know Christians like to talk about what God's doing in us. But let me tell you something. He is an omnipresent God. The Bible says, I mean, forget about for just a second what He's doing in you. He is all around you. The book says um, that we are seated, which means surrounded by God. You would be amazed tonight. I told you you ought to be praising God. Let me help you with your praise because some of y'all look like you're sitting by like your ex, ex, ex mother-in-law or boyfriend or something. You'd be amazed how much the devil has to bust through to get to you. Because you are surrounded, baby. Sorry, I'm going to preach, y'all. You are surrounded, which means engulfed in the Greek. It means shattered. It means layered upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. You've rarely ever had the devil come against you. You just have his little imps throwing stuff over the wall at you because you are surrounded by God. Think about this. Think about all the things you've been through in your life. It could have been a whole lot worse if you hadn't been surrounded. You ought to be praising God for that. So, so here's the deal. We are surrounded by God. The omnipresence of God is everywhere. Now, we're talking about reborn, refreshed, renew, getting, getting re-plugged in, reinvigorated, revived by the power of God. We have got to move from the omnipresence of God, which is what religious people actually spend their lives celebrating in the Christian church. But they're traditional. They're too traditional to be trans, transitional. So they'll... They'll say, that God one day in heaven, that God in yonder in glory land, they'll spend their life singing songs about a God who is omni. But we serve a God who moves when we call on Him from being omnipresent to manifest present. Right. It's where we're sitting here tonight. When they were singing oceans, didn't you just feel something inside of your spirit? Didn't you feel, not that the other songs were crappy, I'm not saying that. The, 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 but something in those moments, when, when they hit, when, when I'm in worship and they hit that moment, to me the service is over. Because that moment is when God manifests Himself in my life. And we need to learn to move if we're going to be revived people. To, who takes a move of God to the world and the nations around us, we have got to learn to move from the omnipresence of God to the manifest presence of God. It's where you start going, God, I know you're there, but will you move in me? Uh-huh. Lord, I know you're there, but will you make your presence known in my life? I'm glad you're with me, but could you shake my house? I, I, I want to walk in the manifest presence of God. So the question before the house is that, are y'all still with me? Y'all out there? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. All right, that, that's the introduction. Was that okay? <laughs> the question I want to ask tonight is this. How do we move? How does, what does it take for the omnipresence of God to manifest in my life? I'm not going to stand up here and say like some denominational people do and theological people that you can just get up here and command God and God jumps around like Santa Claus and like a puppet on a string. You don't do that. You're in sales. He's in management. Okay? And it's kind of like it's kind of like Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament stood up and said, "I'm God, ain't nobody." You know, he had to be a redneck. I'm God, ain't nobody gonna tell me what to do. And God said, "I told you." And he ate green grass on his belly for eight years. Don't tell me that sucker was into a vegetarian diet all of a sudden. You need to read your Bible more. There's some freaky stuff up in there. But I will say this: there are some things we can do. There are some things going on in your life, sir, young man, young lady, mom, dad, tonight that can cause the omnipresent God to manifest and stir you in a way that it will take 25 years of tears thanking Him for one moment. Now, unbelief will cause you to miss God. The Bible does say the gospel is hidden from those that are lost. That's why you can you that's why you can be right in the middle of a move of God and not know it. That's why God is so awesome that one person sitting right here can just be right now already about to weep her eyes or his eyes out because he is God is already coming close to them and the person right next to them spend the rest of their lives in a good church, saved on their way to heaven, and never know the power of what that means. So the question is, what is it? 
that makes us seek God. Well, we will never seek what we think we've already attained. Look, if I just left Cracker Barrel, I'm not looking to go to Red Lobster right after that. Why? Because a full man doesn't need a meal. Come on, talk to me. There is, a, there is a need for some kind of dissatisfaction in your life to make you want to go sit down and have a meal. Nobody just goes seeking to be seeking food. And guess what? Nobody just goes seeking God to seek God. Are you with me? Here it comes. But if you need what you're seeking, you will go through hell and high water and breakups and relationship failures and all kinds of stuff to find the thing that you are searching for. Why? Because you don't just need it a little bit. You need it in the pit of your gut and you know it's the only answer to your soul's emptiness. Look, I'm standing in the, bi bi the belt buckle of the Bible belt. I've been, I've been in every kind of church service that I can tell you. I've been in stuff the pews and climb the walls. I literally have been in churches, I know you're going to laugh, where there are claw marks in the walls where some people decided that they were going to climb Jacob's ladder, I guess, to heaven. I've been in all kinds of church services, and what I have found in my life, it is never enough for me to want God or like God, watch me, or sing songs that make me kind of, sort of, appreciate God, for me to move God's heart toward me, I have to have something in me that needs Him. And I don't mean just, I need you. My bills are past due, I need you. No, 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 no. I mean I need you. Have you ever been there? Have you ever just needed Him? Look at me. Do you need Him tonight? Amen. Have you been making stupid mistake after stupid mistake after stupid mistake? Join the dumb club. It's okay. But you need Him. I found that most of the dumb decisions of my life came from one reason. I was wanting Him. And I settled with what I could see instead of waiting for what, who I could not see, but who was much more real to me than anything. Vivian Green said this, life is not about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning how to dance in the rain. I need Him. So, so when people say stuff like, you know, I, I, I'm too tired to go to Jesus movement or somebody says I'm not going to chapel today because I don't feel like it or I'm not going to church I don't feel like it there, there has to be something raw and nagging inside of it look you wouldn't be sitting here on a Friday night if you didn't have some kind of hunger for God I need Him your, your friends will say to you man why are you so radical when they're singing that song I mean you, you, mascara was running into rouge girl you, you, you look like Alice Cooper. Y'all you, you don't know who I'm talking about. You, 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 you're like, uh, I don't know who. I need him. Why you shout and cry? Because I need him. I need him. And it's dangerous. I'm going to be honest with you. Y'all look nice and put together in here tonight. I guess because we're packed in here like sardines. But it is a dangerous thing I found in my ministry and in my life to sit beside somebody who needs God, because a needy person will jump up and kick the chair all over the top of you. A needy person will shout and there's no music going. Talk to me, somebody. A, ra a radical needy woman will kick your purse over while she's praising God. A needy man will jump up and shout and won't give a flip who the preacher is. Won't care who's singing. Because I need him. I need him. I need him in my life. Why are you so radical? Why are you crazy? We shouldn't, we don't do that here. You may not do that here, but you hadn't been where I've been. And if you've been where I've been, baby, you be shouting like a wild man too. I need him. In fact, I've already gone through enough in my life that if I hadn't had God then, I wouldn't be here now to need him now. So I'm going to praise him now because of one reason. He was there for me then and by God's grace, he will be there for me now because I need him. And like 
the prophet, oh, you, you are not my goal. And like Job said, I won't let you go. Like the prophet, of Jer I hear Jeremiah, I hear Ezekiel. Everybody's dancing in my head right now going, I won't let you go, God, until you bless my soul. I hear Bartimaeus going, I won't let you go until I get my sight back. So when you see me worship loudly, when you see me pray hard, when you see tears go down my cheeks, it's because I'm not showy. I'm looking for His voice. Isn't it crazy to think about that from Genesis to Revelation, there are truths that never change. Isn't that crazy? All those years, eons and eons and decades and decades and centuries and centuries, and the truths that started out in Genesis went right through the end of Revelation and probably spilled over into concordance and maps for all I know. All the same. Let me just give you an example. Uh, okay, let's start at the beginning. In the beginning, who? God. Not man, not philosophy, not concepts, not, not, not ideas. Four words. If you flunk that, close the book. I mean, if you, can, if you can't accept God, you will never be able to accept in the beginning God. Because before the time ever had a date, we'll align God. In, watch this, ooh, this is good. In the beginning, God, omnipresence. In the beginning, omnipresent God, created, manifest presence. The omnipresent God manifested Himself when He created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form, it says, and void. Now, y'all, God gets really stirred up in His manifestology. Why? Well, look what the earth was doing. Look what creation was doing. What there was of it. It was just floating around like a big old blubbering man. Just blue, just floating around. No boundaries. No character. Did you hear what it said? And the earth was without form and void. Do you know what the word void means? The word void means empty. God likes empty. God, oh church people, if you're a church person, please hear this, I beg you. God never moves on full. Oh, come on, y'all. God gets excited about empty. If you are a person tonight that has to always appear full like I did for years of my ministry and my Christian life, you are going to be a frustrated man or woman. Because God is never attracted to full. But God is so attracted to empty. And the earth was without form and void. And it says the moment God manifested Himself and saw that the earth was void, it says immediately, and the Spirit of the Lord moved. Why? Because God will never move on full. He will always move on empty. See, to me, this is contradictory to this leadership, followership, goofy Christianity that we've tried to create in America that has, it has good points. It's just not in the Bible. That you have to, uh, that you have in you what it takes, and you're this, and you're self made, and you can do it, and you can overcome, and yet the book says in the beginning of the first page, God never moved on full. He moves when we're empty and weak and full of need. When He saw creation that was void, think about it air empty of birds. Water empty of fish, land empty of vegetation, earth empty of man, then it's like God just said, Now I'm going to manifest. What am I telling you? Look at me, everybody. Come in real close. If you want God to move, I dare you to have a need. I 
dare you to have a need. An emptiness, a place in your life where you go, I'm saved, but I'm unsure. I go to church, but it's not filling me. I, I pray, but they're empty. I go to worship concerts, but it doesn't last. I go to this. I've got my iTunes is chocked full and jamming of Christian stuff, but it's not getting me where I need to be. I, if you want God to really move, just open up the vault of your dusty, empty place. And he'll manifest. Do you feel that? He just manifested. Because before there is a word of God, before there was ever a Bible to put in anybody's on anybody's coffee table, there was a move of God. And he moves and mountains tremble. Come on, people. He moves. And winds hush. He moves and waves lay down slain in the Spirit by the power of a God who just rolls over and says, Hush! You see, some of us can't get God to speak because we can't get God to move. But I found in my life, and I'm just being an elder brother to some of us, I have found that when I am so desperate and I am so sick of me, that's when he says, now, let me show you how bad I am. I remember years ago, I don't even remember where I was. I, I was somewhere preaching and I was really nervous. And I don't know why I was nervous. I mean, I did it every night in my life. And I was just so nervous. And I, I just, I was like, golly. So I was in a, you know, a little back Sunday school room with bird egg blue paint on cinder block walls. And it smelled like mold from 1844 down there. And I was hauled up in this Sunday school room. And I was nervous. I was pacing. And I mean, I bet there wasn't 150 people out there in the sanctuary. And I was just as nervous. And I just prayed this prayer. I said, God, why am I such a wreck? And as clearly as I See the four of you that I do see. God spoke in my heart. I didn't see an angel. Why nothing out here? But God just spoke in me. And as clearly as I see the four of you, all of a sudden, God said this. He said, Brady, do you know why you're so nervous and so messed up? I said, why? He said, because you're more worried about what they think of you and what they're going to think of you than you are glorifying me. You are more self-conscious then you are God conscious. And as long as you are self conscious, Brady, you will never know the power. See, some of you have yet, I, I hate to tell you, but I got one shot tonight. I'm going to load my gun and just blow you to pieces. Some of you still think this Christian life is about you. And I, I can smell you a, a hundred miles away. It's all about what God's going to do in my life. And oh gee whiz, God is just the best God. And He just loves you and He accepts you and He does love you and He does accept you. And now He's wanting to manifest so He can change you and make you a fresh person and update you to where God can move in your life. Let me tell you something. Somebody told me years ago, it is better, Brady, for... It is better for you to be hated for what you are than loved for what you're not. And some of us just need to decide who are we and what are we going to be. So, so, so here's the deal. God can make you so desperate for Him. Can I ask you something? Let me just time out. Is there anything stirring in you right now? I mean, I mean seriously. Is this more than just great worship and a... Wild little preacher up here. Is, is it more to... Has, has, has the Christian life become more... God, God forgive us, Ryan. For, God forgive us, y'all. That we, we, we now... We, we've got so many stars in the church today, you can't see Jesus. That's right. That's right. And to be honest with you, I, I'm tired. I'm weary. 
And I used to strive to want to be some of those people until I met some of them. And, there's, and I'll be honest with you, there are times in my life I still wish, you know, you, do you know what a celebrity is? A celebrity is somebody who lost themselves to find something that was fake. And the church is full of it. And your iTunes are full of it. And your favorite preachers are full of it, some of them. And we, we have elevated all this stardom. And when all God wants to do is penetrate your heart and give you a freshness that when you become desperate for Him, He moves on you. The moment you decide, lady, I don't care who wants I don't care if I lose friends. I don't care who's looking at me. I'm, I'm willing to put my dignity aside, shatter my alabaster box, and put my forehead in the lap of the only one who matters in my life. God will not speak where He cannot move. You say, Brady, how do you know that? Been there, done that, bought the whole t-shirt factory. You say, yeah, but that was before you became a Christian. That was years ago. No, man, that was last week. And God said, let us, let us create, let us move, let us move in the power of God. You see, you see, here's the deal. We've done something bad in the Christian life. We, we, through the publishing companies and through television and through internet, we've done something really wrong. And it's this to a lot of people. We've told people that if they just come to Jesus, they'll never have a problem. Their dog will never pee the rug. I mean, you know, the, 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 you know, they'll be dating Magic Mike within three days and he'll have Jesus all over him and biceps. You know, you, you'll never have a problem. You'll never, you'll never go broke. You'll never have bankruptcy. You'll never all that. And yet, and yet, that's not the reality. Let me ask you something. When has God done the best of moving in your life when you were completely and utterly broke, helpless, had nobody to turn to, nobody to run to, not a person, nobody could help you, and you got you shut the door of your dorm room or you shut the door of your closet and you got down on your face and you said, God, I can't take this another moment. Breathe on me, Holy Spirit. Move in my life. I need you. And all of a sudden, I am poor and I need Him. I know church people who have seemingly, Christian people, who have seemingly can't come to a place um, where they've outgrown their need for God. Young people, don't you ever get where I am half of my life thinking I can do this. Don't you ever, if I never see you again, don't you ever outgrow your need. Don't you ever lose your tears. Don't you ever lose your soft heart. It will set you back 20 or 30 years in God's destiny for your life. The moment you think you clean up, and you really repent, and you've really got involved in church, and, 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 and you think, because I've done this, I'll never have a need, I'll never have a problem. It's not true. I have found in my life, and I found it the hard way, y'all, You will, God will always keep you in some kind of a need. I'm serious. I would love to success manual you up here and say, come to Jesus. And you'll never have a problem. Life will be good. It's BS. When you come to Jesus, all hell will break loose in your life. Wow, who wants to sign up for this one tonight? It's just true, isn't it? Think about it. Before you came to be a Christ follower, you were in the river just floating downstream. <whistles> laid back on your little... Um, Pontoon, just going down. I don't know why I thought of that. 
I'm, I'm, I know I'm not saved. Just go ahead and preach me. But I, I, you were just going down the river, having, and then all of a sudden you found that peace and forgiveness and life was back upstream. So what did you do? You got off of your pontoon and you started going back upstream and you hacked the devil off and he took your picture and he put it right on the post office in hell. Now you've got battles. Before you didn't have any battle. You could date who you wanted to, sleep with who you want to, go do who you want to, eat what you want, feel what you want, say what you want, all that stuff. Now you got a mess going on because you got this Jesus. Preach, white boy, I think I'm going to. You got this Jesus that came into your life. And when he came into your life, he set you free. He put some, He put a flame down inside of you that all hell couldn't quench. And now he is your God and he is your king and he is your master and he is your prince and he is your king and your banner and your lord and when the enemy comes in like a flood and says what's this like for you now well don't you just want to get back and float you say you know what I'd rather be locked up where I am now than loose where I used to be because there's something about Jesus there's something about his name and his power Think about this. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. So when God wants you to use you, He will always paint on the canvas of need. Need and supply. Need and supply. You will have to go through that every day of your Ask Israel. Those suckers went around. It, they could have walked through that desert in a matter of days. And they went out there and circled that desert for 40 years. Do you know why? Because they didn't understand need and supply. Need and supply. You will always be in the... You know what I've been thanking God here lately? As as bad, as sludgy, as garbagey as sometimes I feel in my spirit life. I've still been praying this here lately. Thank you, Jesus, that you always keep me needy. Because I've been the other direction. I've been arrogant. But now you've got me in need. And you can't get arrogant when you're needy. If you don't believe me, come with me to downtown Nashville and look at them homeless people sitting out there like my wife and I saw in front of the library right there across from Puckett's Grocery right there. And, and look at those people. They, 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 they will, they will, a drowning man will grab a banana peel if you throw it at him. Why? Because he's in need. There's no arrogance in his life. I would have been proud of myself, but you kept me in need. I would have outgrown my desperation, but you kept me need. Th think about this. Can I ask another question? What is it? Have you ever thought about the Christian life? What is it that would make a visible person come in here to a storefront, collectively with other friends, a visible people come together and cry out to an invisible God? Well, when you start saying, Lord, I need you. I'm not crazy. I just need him. I'm crying, but I'm crying not because I'm schizo. I'm crying because I've got something I've had in me for five years. Ten years. Six months. And I need him in that area of my life. You know, um, but what's amazing to me, it, just a little side note here, back to Adam. Think, think about Adam. Adam's, he's being created at this point in creation, and, and, and Adam is, is, is in the garden, you know, in the beginning, his spirit moved, and, and when Adam was just dust and put together mud, just a little mud pie of a little dude. The Bible says that God breathed the breath. It's the Ruah. Everybody say Ruah. That's not samurai stuff. That's Bible. It, the, the Ruah. The Spirit of God. And, and what's amazing to me, watch this, is that Adam's laying there and, and God went over to Adam and breathed into him. 
right? And he went, <laughs> I love this. He breathed into him. And when God breathed on and into Adam, he ruad into, on and into him. And the Bible says that Adam woke up. And the first face he saw, y'all, was the face of God. His first breath was the breath that had gone into him. Preach honky. I will. <laughs> when God breathed into Adam, ladies and gentlemen, watch this. He just breathed out what God had put in him. Can you imagine? He woke up and his first exhale was the breath of God. It's ruah in Hebrew. It's pneuma in Greek. Romans 8 says, if the spirit, the pneuma, the breath that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is living in you, then it says God gives you power. And life. So when a baby is born, it has to breathe in and out before the whole delivery room will settle down a little bit. Do you know why? It's just God leaning over the balcony of glory, making sure the human testators know that that baby, the first breath that comes out of that baby is His breath that went into Him. Good God. That means when you sit across the table with your atheist friends and they say, there is no God. They just ruined by God's permission. So when they say, there is no God, you ought to look back at me and go, ruined. You <laughs> That will end your conversation. That'll end it. I mean, they're going to say, I told you there's some freaks in the church, man. This woman just spit peas all over me in the lunchroom. So, so, so here's the deal. You, you, do you remember, you remember also in the Bible, the widow who met the prophet. She goes, I'm in debt. I have collectors. I'm in desperate need. But I've heard about the God of Israel. And the prophet says, what do you have? She said, I've got, remember this? This pot of oil. The prophet says, oh no, you, you can't get God's help. Because that's too much. You see, look at me, lady. As long as you think you can float Christianity through your life, sir, as long as you think you can do it, as long as you think that you've got everything it takes to do it, think about it. In your own arrogance, you will nail, you will stop getting on your face and crying out to Him for further directions. So when the widow said to the prophet, I've got this oil, God said, then you've got too much for God to use. He said, go borrow, go borrow more vessels. Translation, make it real needy. Make it real bad. Bring him in the house and shut the door. And the widow said, well, what about this pot of oil I got? I went and borrowed all these other things, these other vats. Now what do I do? And the prophet says, pour out that oil, but it's all I have left. You're not with me. It's my singing ability. It's my instrument ability. It's my preaching ability. It's my ability to, for the degree that I'm in college for. It's, it's my oil. It's my gift. It's what I have. The prophet says, pour it out. Why pour it out? It's full. That's what's wrong with it. Why, y'all? Oh, get this tonight. Because we have a God who never will bless what is full. He will only move on what is empty. This water bottle that I brought up here is three-fourths full of water. That means I can only fill it a fourth. But if it's completely empty and it's standing here underneath me and it's saying, Brady, I am an empty vessel, guess what? Then it has the capacity to be filled with whatever I want to put in it. As long as you're full or as long as you have to act full, you will never know the power of being a revived, refreshed person. That's the power of God, y'all. That's the power of God. 
And I know some people who cannot get what they desire from God. You know why? Because they spend their whole Christian life playing it safe. As long as you can make it fit into your logic, you will never need God and you'll spend your Christian life always saying, why are they acting like that? Why is she so desperate? Why do they praise God like that? I have found in my life, and you have too, God won't keep your feet from falling until you're out on a limb. So, if you're here tonight and you have more loneliness than you do companionship, if you have more of a broken heart than you feel like you have a peace-filled heart, if you have a need for companionship, if you're here tonight and you're, you're, like, you're not as thirsty for God as you were when you were a kid in those student camps, if you're not as thirsty for who He is, and, or if you're sitting here going, like I've been doing a lot, there's got to be more than what I've had. Then you are right. And you're the one God is going to manifest Himself in in such a way tonight it will blow our minds. Can we talk? Have you ever noticed you can get one area of your life fixed and another one falls completely apart just the moment you get that one area fixed? Do you know why that happens? God is trying to keep you in need. <laughs> and God only anoints who's got the guts to pour out in His presence. And, and here's the deal. It's, it's, it's as you're pouring out. It's as you're pouring out in front of Him. The Bible is full. The widow, as she poured it out. Um, the marriage of Cana, it says, as the vessels were being emptied of water, it turned into wine. As we're pouring out. It is the will of God for God to see us pour out first. James 4, 8. I almost preached it tonight. Draw near unto God and He will draw near unto you. Who draws first? We do. I am the one that will determine the level of the intensity of the, of the neediness and the response of God being omnipresent or Him manifesting in my life. Man, this is good preaching, isn't it? I, are we recording this? I'm going to buy this CD myself. This is good. <laughs> Do you remember in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, when Jesus was speaking to the church at Laodicea, He said this. He said, you say, talking to church people, and said, if this doesn't sound like church people in America, I don't know what does. He said this. You say to your community, the city, everybody, you say you're rich and have need of nothing. You're out bragging that all your bills are paid, that everything is paid off, and you have need of nothing. Huh. And maybe that's why the rebuke from the Savior came. Because you have no need, I can't move on you. Oh, you're saved. You're on your way to heaven. But you have no need. I told you in the beginning of this service, I, 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 revival and Moves of God, awakenings are just the thing that I guess my whole life is going to be about. I didn't plan it uh, to be about it, but it's just God's put me in places where I've seen the presence of God. I'll never forget years ago, um, I was in, down in Georgia, and we had gone through about three weeks of revival in this church. I mean, we had seen God just show up. And I mean, we, when God shows up, He does show out. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was just... God was moving. And that revival actually started because church leaders got sick of junk and church and politics and you know, all that stuff. It was one of the few times in my life where I saw on American soil church leaders just go, God, we're sick of it all. And they stood up in front of their churches and said that. It's crazy. I'll never forget one night I was preaching or getting ready to preach. I had just prayed and I was, it's one of those days where I was just, I was a wreck. You can tell I'm a mess anyway. But I was trying to act all professional like I used to do and be the man of God, you know. And it was the beginning stages of God really breaking me down to just being real in front of people. And long story short, I walked into this church. The church is called the Sherwood Forest Baptist Church in Rome, Georgia. I thought Robin Hood was going to come out, you know. <laughs> 
you know. And um, anyway, yeah. And so I, I, I was up there preaching. The place was jam packed. I mean, this little church is probably five, six hundred people, way capacity. I got up there, and I just, it was one of those moments. I had just began my freshness. God was breaking down the walls that I had built up of professionalism and just a lot of junk that I won't go into. But God just was breaking down my walls, and I got up there, and I just, I just, I was just about to start to preach, and I just said, I just need to pray if it's okay. And I started to pray, and it went about this high off the ground. And so there was a lot of pastors there, because this revival had been going on for a while. There's a lot of pastors there. So I mean, they were, I knew they were out there because I could smell the brute cologne all over the place. There was preachers everywhere, man. And a uh, lot of students were showing up, and it was just a fantastic episode. So I knew there were pastors out there. And so I knew a few of them, and I, so I called on a couple of them to just stand up and pray. I knew they were there. I'd seen them in the prayer meeting before the service. And they stood up, and the pastors prayed pretty good. I got, I called on a youth pastor to pray, and he, he prayed. All of a sudden, I just, God just downloaded in my spirit, Brady, call on some teenagers to just pray. And I just had no more said, y'all, and I, I don't expect you to believe this, but I do have witnesses. I just said, I need some teenagers to stand and pray. I had no more said that. 50 or 60. And I found out later they weren't just like high school. They were college. Jumped up and just all of them praying at the same time. In a very traditional church. Praying. I mean, just praying. When their prayers died down one after the other... I couldn't hardly see her, but I, I could see the silhouette of a beautiful blonde-headed girl standing in the balcony. She had both her arms out like this, best I remember, and she was praying at the top of her lungs. Oh, God, save my daddy! Save my daddy. God, he needs Jesus. God, save my school. Lord, our town, our county, Floyd County, Georgia, is so dead religiously. God, would you come? Would you save? She just prayed like I'd never seen. The best celebrities in the church pray. You don't want to hear this next, but I'm going to tell you what happened. It was as if God reached under the platform, under the foundation of that church, y'all. Picked it up three or four feet. I don't expect you to believe me. Three or four, maybe five feet off the ground. Let go of it and slammed that church to the ground. I turned around and my best friend is named Dr. Jack Fisher. Jack Fisher was on the platform to my left on this church. He was coming up to pray for me. When I turned around, Jack was praying himself. And I looked over at him and I said, Go out and tell me that there's a thundercloud storm or something over this building. He walked out the little side door, came right back in and said, Brady, there is not a cloud in the sky. I turned and looked and there was 550, maybe stretching 600 people in that building. When I turned back from seeing Jack turn, I looked out, y'all, and 430 or more were flat on their face in repentance. You see, God had come. And, and the need of one girl set a church on fire. Because oh, God doesn't move on full. God moves on empty. I spent weeks, then years, around Rome, Georgia. Not because I had good sermons. Not because we had good music. Not because we were relevant. But because God, people were funneling and, and eating and drinking off the hunger and neediness of a young girl 
who was praying, oh God, I don't care what anybody thinks. All I need is a need. And I give it to you. Can I ask you to something? Man, y'all feel God in this place? Look at me. How long has it been since He put you on your face? Not because you were full or it was the thing to do in your youth service or your college to, or at Passion or wherever you... How long has it been since you unlocked that, that door of that thing that everybody's told you, the enemy has lied to you and said, push it down, push it down, push it down. How long has it been since you cracked that door open, let the spider webs out, let some fresh light come in that dark place and said, God, I bring you the neediest child of yours in the world right now. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care what anybody else says. I just want your presence to manifest in me. Did you know there's not a singer in the world that can make you do that? There's not a preacher in the world that can make you do that. But if you'll crack open the crusty door of the greatest, deepest needs of your life, I'm telling you, God will manifest in your, in your soul. There are moves of God in my life, and I know I've preached too long, but get over it. I love you. There are moves of God that have happened in my life. I will spend the rest of my life still shaking my head going, I have no idea what He did right then. And it was so beautiful, I don't even want to try to explain it. Amen? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I just don't even want to try. Because I know that your God, my God, our God is so utterly creative, He never even replicates or duplicates the same snowflake. That means tonight in this room is a moment you don't need to do anything except put your pride down. You need to put your dignity aside. I need to put my pride and my dignity aside. And I need to look up at the heavens and say, God, if nobody else in this Jesus movement here tonight needs you, I need you. That means, young lady, the things that your psychotherapists and your counselors and your youth pastors all when you were a kid were telling you push down, don't talk about it, push it away. Tonight is the night because you can't push a beach ball down long, it's going to come back up. Tonight, it's the night to take that door open and take it out before God. I'm talking about bring that rape out, bring that molestation out, bring that drug addiction out, bring that secret porn addiction out, bring that garbage out, bring that abuse out, bring it out, bring it out, get it in the light show the omnipresent God I need you to manifest over this and you will find he will turn your misery into a ministry he will take your passion and turn it into a mission but he cannot move if you keep the doors locked do you know what that means tonight that means tonight you're in a safe place no 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 you are it's okay to cry it's okay to weep. It's okay to come before God tonight and say, God, I am a wreck and you know it. I need you to move on my life, in my life. I found in my life, God usually manifests Himself most of the time. Sometimes because I call on Him, but most of the time He'll do it in spite of me. Because He's a grace-filled God. And He'll come and start ministering to me and knocking on that door. And I'll do this sometimes. I'll say, God, don't do this. Because when I cry, it's not pretty. When I cry, it's ugly. God, move in my life. Think of the best church service you've ever been in. I mean, or the best moment in your life, apart from your salvation experience, where you just thought, if it gets any better, I'm going to spill over into heaven. Remember that moment? Remember how you've been chasing that moment ever since it happened? Well, let, let an old guy tell you something. That doesn't even come close to what he could do. 
You haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg of the manifesting presence, nor have I, of a holy God when we crack open our souls and go, I need you. So if you're here tonight and Christianity has been a game to you, you don't really have Jesus in you. Oh, you go to church occasionally, but He's not real in your heart. That means tonight the omnipresent God that you feel swirling around you sometimes shows you a beautiful mountain, does whatever. He can come into your life tonight. Amen, born again. Amen. He can come into your life Instead of you spinning your life around and around and seeing Him, He will come into your life. That means in a moment, when my brothers and sisters are leading in worship again in a moment, it means you can just take the chains off and say, I cannot float myself. I invite you, Jesus, to come into my life and manifest in me. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. It also means this. In just a moment... In just a moment, I'm not commanding. I'm a broken down, messed up human being. If you, did you know if you knew the sins in my life, you probably wouldn't even sit here and listen to me. Now don't get cocky. If I knew the sins in your life, I probably wouldn't talk to you. But the great thing about tonight is that we're a colossal collection of moral foul-ups. And here in just a moment, I'm going to pray. My brothers and sisters are going to come and lead. I don't want anybody to leave this, leave this building unless it's an absolute emergency. And in a moment, when, as I pray, I want you to splay yourself before God. If you have to get out of your seat and come and get on your face at this makeshift altar, there's plenty of room at the front. And if you have to stay here till midnight, if you have to stay here till 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, my God, if you have to stay here till the sun rises, if you have to stay here until tomorrow night's service, be willing to do it to bring God the needs, the emptiness in your life. Come before God. Say, God, I'm empty and I need you. So, no heads are bowed, no eyes are closed, no traditional stuff here tonight. Is there any woman in this room who would simply say, I just need you. I'm a wreck. I need you. I'm so hungry. I'm so thirsty. Is there any, any brother here tonight who would just say, I don't even know what to do, but my stomach is jumping out of my ears right now. I need you, God. I need you. And whoever cracks the first moment will break the membrane and the worship of God will begin. And all of a sudden, what we felt as omnipresence tonight, He'll start manifesting Himself in this place. If you're thirsty for God, if you're hungry, it means there's water somewhere. It means there's bread somewhere. So when I start praying, whoever you are, I don't know who you are, but God's working on somebody here. I want you to get them out of your seat. I want you to go to your face. Yes, go to your face and say, God... I am the one. I need you. I'm so hungry for you to move. All I need is that need. And God, I bring it to you tonight. Are you ready? Man, don't y'all feel God in this place. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. It means, it means tonight you don't have to act like you were an abused person. It, it means tonight you don't have to continue to act and act and act. You can just splay yourself before a holy God tonight. You're in a safe place. Nobody's going to get up in your business. Nobody's going to hurt you. It means tonight you can just come before God and say, God, I'm a, I'm a better Baptist than I am a Christian. I need you. I'm a better Catholic than I am a believer. I'm a better Methodist than I am. What I need you. I need you. I feel you sometimes. I know you're there. But God, I need you. Some of you, one more thing, and then I'm going to pray. Some of you, you're not going to do it for yourself tonight because you're a selfless person. I know you are. But you have a brother in California. Like that young girl, you got a daddy who's who's strung out right now in prison or at the bar. You've got, some of you have just gone through a divorce, gone through pain, gone through agony. Tonight, 
You don't spray yourself before God in your stand. You do it for somebody that may be 3,000 miles from here. But there's no distance in the power of the Spirit of God. Amen. Are you ready? Are you ready? Is there any woman? Is there any boy? Any young man? Any daddy? Any worship team leader that just says, I don't care about anything. I want you. I want you to get up out of your seat and either go to your face at your seat or find your way to this altar. If it's for one person, it's worth the whole night. Say amen, somebody. Amen. We're not about numbers and getting everybody into a froth. We're about somebody cracking open their heart fresh and saying, I need a fresh move of God in my life. It's time. It's when all the hell's been about all the pain. It's all culminating right now. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your anointing, your power, your glory to come in this place. God, I ask you from the back row of this balcony to this platform, I ask you to send your power and your spirit in this place. Send the kind of anointing that breaks yokes and bondages and sets women free and sets men free and sets all captives free. I pray you do it in the mighty, awesome name of Jesus. The name above every name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Humble King.